I'm astonished that we've managed to stay on schedule. Um, this is amazing. I, I know, Andrew did a great job of uh, putting fear in everyone, sticking to 10 minutes, and now I have to stick to my uh, time limit as well. Uh, I, first of all, I want to thank all the other think tanks uh, represented here for participating in this and for giving up their time uh, on relatively short notice to do this exercise. I also want to thank my CSBA colleagues uh, who made this uh, possible as well, in particular Mark Gunzinger, uh, my partner in crime in designing uh, the methodology that we used here. Um, now, I want to take a minute, and you've heard the different strategic approaches from each of the teams. What I did over the weekend was I went through all of the data uh, from the databases uh, and compared what they did, the specific selections they made, and I tried to look for where there was some consensus across the teams, because that tells us something pretty important. That tells us that given the range of strategies that you've heard here, that there are some things that everyone agrees on or three or four teams agree on. Uh, and these are things that we probably ought to take notice that you know, regardless of what strategy we end up pursuing, uh, these are things that are likely to happen. Uh, so first of all, a quick overview, and I don't expect you to be able to read this all the way in the back. I'm gonna point out to you, um, these are the, the overall ads and cuts under the full BCA budget scenario for each of the teams. And the thing I wanna point out here is where the teams all got the most savings was in personnel. Every single team uh, got the most savings from cutting personnel. Now that includes active duty, guard, reserve, and DOD civilians, all lumped in together there, but that's where the savings were on all of the teams. Now when you go to the half BCA uh, scenario, the uh, hashed red bars, that shows you the cuts that they bought back when they had uh, relatively more money, uh, when they didn't have, did not have to cut as much under the second scenario. And the hashed green bars show you where they made additional investments when they had that extra money freed up. Uh, the thing I would point out here is that while all of the teams took readiness cuts under the full Budget Control Act level uh, of budget, uh, all of the teams bought back readiness uh, when they got a, a lower level of budget cuts. Uh, two of the teams uh, completely eliminated their readiness cuts, and the other two teams uh, reduced the amount of readiness cuts by more than half. The other thing I'd point out here uh, is the greatest degree of rebalancing we saw within any one category was in the air category. Uh, all of the teams made substantial cuts and ads within the air category. And so that's interesting. Let's look at it in a little more detail. Uh, if you break it out, the first row here is the full BCA level of cuts. Uh, and I divided it, this is unmanned aircraft. I divided it between the non-stealthy uh, and the stealthy. And so the non-stealthy unmanned aircraft are uh, things like your Predators, your Reapers, uh, the NU class that's planned that we're going to procure, the Gray Eagle, things that are really designed to operate in a low threat environment, relatively low threat environment, and are geared more towards counterterrorism type operations. The stealthy UAVs uh, are kind of the next generation uh, that people are thinking about now. Uh, they would incorporate things like all aspect stealth so they could operate in a higher threat environment. And what we saw is three of the four teams made significant cuts in non-stealthy UAVs uh, under the full BCA. Uh, but what was most interesting to me is three of the four teams made significant new investments in stealthy UAVs, including a stealthy UAV that could operate off of carriers, the NUCAS. Uh, and the, the level of investment uh, was regardless of the level of uh, budget cuts that we saw. So that looks like something that these teams thought was important, uh, a rebalancing, if you will, that the teams thought was important regardless of the level of budget cuts. Uh, in the category of fighter and attack aircraft, uh, similar division here uh, between non-stealthy legacy uh, type fighter aircraft and stealthy aircraft. Uh, commonality we saw here is that every single team under both budget scenarios uh, made significant cuts to legacy A-10s, F-15s, and F-16s. Uh, and of course, this has been a contentious issue on the Hill in the past when the Air Force has proposed similar cuts. They get a lot of pushback from Congress, but all of the teams here uh, made reductions in those legacy fighters uh, under both levels of uh, budget cuts. Bombers was another area where we saw some consensus across the teams. Uh, under the full BCA cuts, three of the four teams uh, cut the B-1 bombers. Uh, and under both budget scenarios, three of the four teams 
plussed up. That is, they accelerated the development of the next generation bomber for the Air Force. So that was an interesting rebalancing that we saw as well. Now, under sea capabilities, uh, we also saw a good amount of rebalancing. It tended to be a little more in the net positive direction for several of the teams. Uh, but if you dig into that, you know, we're looking for well, where specifically was the consensus. When it came to submarines, there wasn't a lot of consensus other than every single team either protected or increased uh, the buy of Virginia-class submarines. But they did a lot of different things in there, investing in uh, you know, unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, investing in better sensors, munitions, things like that for anti-submarine warfare. Um, but not a lot of consensus on exactly what to do. Where we did see consensus in the sea category was in the surface fleet. Uh, if you look at surface combatants, every single team in both moves cut the number of carriers. They all, all teams in both budget scenarios, uh, slowed the procurement of the new Ford class carriers and retired one or more of the existing carriers. So you can see it ranged from uh, cutting two to cutting four carriers from the fleet, and this is what would be in the fleet at the end of our exercise, FY23. All of the teams also uh, uh, retired cruisers earlier than currently planned. We actually limited them to only retiring nine early, uh, since all 15 are eventually slated for retirement. Uh, and they all maxed it out, except in their half BCA, one team uh, did not max out. Uh, well, actually, they did still retire all the cruisers. They were starting to buy a next-gen cruiser is what it was. Uh, destroyers, uh, three, uh, under the full BCA, all the teams reduced the buy of destroyers. Half BCA, three or four teams still reduced the buy of destroyers. In ground forces, we did not see as much rebalancing. What we saw really were net cuts for the ground forces. Uh, in the Marine Corps, um, teams did a lot of different things, not a lot of consensus there, but where we did see consensus was in the Army. Uh, in the uh, active Army, we saw a consensus about cutting particularly the armored BCTs. Under the full BCA budget scenario, uh, all of the teams actually ended up with the same number of armored BCTs they would cut. Six BCTs cut, uh, that is half the number of armored BCTs in the active force. The other thing I would point out here that's interesting is these cuts were relatively independent of the budget scenario that we, we gave them. If you compare all the numbers in the, in the first half of this chart, the full BCA to the second half, the half BCA, uh, team by team, they're all identical with just this exception. Uh, AEI uh, did not cut as many armored BCTs under the half BCA and they did not cut as much in strength. Everyone else is the same though. Um, and the reserve component, we saw similar symmetry, uh, or consistency, I should say, across the budget levels. Uh, and again, uh, everything is identical under the two budget levels, except for this in CNAS. Uh, under the half BCA, they did not cut the one reserve striker BCT. So a lot of consensus there. That's something I think that's worth uh, taking note of. In space and cyber, we also saw uh, some consistency. Under the full BCA cuts and the half BCA cuts, teams made significant investments uh, in cyber. And to be fair, because you know all of this is unclassified, uh, when, we were, when we were playing cyber options in the game, it was really adding money as a level of effort, uh, basically paying for more people to do whatever it is they're doing, that good work they're doing. <laughs> um, and so all of the teams made significant new investments uh, in cyber capabilities. Also, we saw under the half BCA cuts, uh, three or four teams added protected SATCOM satellites. These are satellites that, can op that are resistant to jamming and, and can operate in a higher threat environment. And three of the four teams also added GPS satellites to make the constellation more robust in the future. Uh, under strategic forces and missile defense, we saw some commonality under the full BCA cuts. All of the teams uh, reduced the number of ICBMs. We gave them the option of cutting ICBMs by wing. There's roughly 150 missiles per wing. We have three wings right now of ICBMs. All of the teams made uh, cut at least one wing under the full BCA. Uh, and we also gave them the option to cancel the remainder of the ground-based mid-course defense system. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the ground-based interceptors uh, that we have right now. We gave them the option to cancel the remainder of that development and test program, and three of the four uh, teams took that option under both levels of budget cuts. 
Now, even though we were talking pretty significant budget cuts here, uh, full BCA budget cuts and half BCA budget cuts, the team still thought it was a priority to make some investments uh, in key areas, science and technology investments. And particularly under the half BCA level of cuts, every single team made investments in undersea sensors and UUVs. Uh, three of the four teams made investments in unmanned ground vehicles and ground and sea-based directed energy. Uh, and all four teams made investments in railgun technology. So these look like areas of investments uh, that these teams thought the DOD should be making even in the face of significant budget cuts. In special operations, we saw uh, a fair amount of rebalancing, but for three of the teams at least, we saw net ads uh, in, the se in special operations forces. Now, there was not a lot of agreement on exactly what to add. Uh, we did see that there was agreement all four teams cut civil affairs battalions, both from the active and the reserve component. Uh, but other than that, there was not a lot of commonality among, uh, across the specifics of what to do in special operations. In readiness, as each of the teams have, have spoken to before, um, all of the teams made cuts in readiness uh, under the full BCA. But I think this is interesting because under the half BCA, you can see how much they bought back of that. This shows that it was something the teams uh, were doing as basically a last resort, um, that they felt they had to do this or they couldn't make everything else balance, uh, and it would completely break the strategy. Uh, and so the teams were willing to accept some risk when they had to, but when they had uh, a lower level of cuts, they bought that back. Uh, so this is something they did reluctantly. Now, I want to close on this one. I thought this was pretty interesting, that even though, again, we were talking budget cuts here, uh, we gave the teams the option to do a BRAC. And I insisted on costing this realistically, that a BRAC costs you money up front. And we gave them the option to buy BRAC, <laughs> where basically you could buy it in increments of $5 billion, and you would not recoup the savings over the course of this game. Uh, it would cost you money in the first fight up, and it would save you a smaller amount of money in the second fight up on the hope that you would continue to save money in the long run. Uh, and even given that, even given that it was going to cost them money to do this option in the game, all of the teams elected to do a BRAC, even under the full BCA cuts. It's also interesting that all of the teams cut DOD civilians pretty significantly in some cases, and the number of DOD civilians they cut did not vary based on the level of budget cuts. They cut, all of the teams cut the same number of DOD civilians, whether it was full BCA or half BCA. Uh, and, and so I think that's remarkable, uh, given the range of strategies, the range of views of the people you see on this panel, um, that there was so much agreement in this area in particular. And I will use that to actually highlight an event uh, that we're going to have on Monday uh, here on the other side of the Capitol. Uh, it's at the Senate Russell uh, Office Building, room 485, at noon on Monday. Uh, we've actually put together, uh, because we've had these discussions for quite a while amongst those of us in the think tank community, that we all seem to agree on the need for BRAC, the need for resizing and reshaping the DOD civilian workforce, and on the need for compensation reform, which we didn't play in this game, because I'm quite sure all of them would have selected that as free money uh, to, to put in here. But on those three things, there seems to be a pretty broad agreement within the think tank community. Uh, and we've put together a joint think tank letter we're going to be releasing on Monday at noon over at Russell uh, 485. And I think all of the members of the panel here and some of you in the audience are, are signed on to that letter. I think we got 25 signatures uh, so far. Um, more than that, 30? <laughs> What's that? 10 think tanks, 10 different think tanks, uh, over 25 individuals uh, signed that letter. Uh, I think that's pretty remarkable when people across the aisle, across a broad political spectrum can agree on these things, but yet Congress can't. Um, uh, it's pretty remarkable and worth taking note of. Uh, so that is my last slide. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, and my goodness, this thing works. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm just simply astounded. I was timing it. Uh, each of these four individuals stayed at 10 minutes or under. This, this may be the first uh, and probably the last time you'll ever see anything like this in Washington. A uh, couple of general observations, and then we'll go into questions. One is uh, it struck me that each of the four teams 
essentially sees uh, risk increasing over time, uh, which is to say that they see the security environment deteriorating over time. Uh, and, and yet, at the same time, you're, you're cutting uh, your defense budget. Uh, in other words, you see the threat rising, but your resources to deal with the threat are decreasing. Um, second, I was really impressed by the fact, if you saw sort of the, the, the red and the green, green investments and, uh, and red in terms of cuts, uh, I think uh, several team members expressed it really well, starting out by saying, what are the really important things we need to do? as opposed to, you know, let's do a, a budget cut drill and let's just start cutting and see where we end up. Uh, Sam Nunn, I think, put it really well at the end of the Cold War where he said, uh, budgets are gonna go down, uh, but we shouldn't expect to see a smaller and similar military. Uh, what we need to see, yes, is what we're gonna get is a smaller military, but we're gonna need a different kind of military. And I think uh, what we've seen here is evidence uh, from these four individuals that uh, that's uh, good advice then, and as we transition now, it's, it's good advice uh, for the present. Uh, what I would suggest we do now is to go into questions. Uh, if when you have a question, if you could stand, uh, state your affiliation, and what, uh, obviously your question, and whether it's for any particular individual or for the group uh, at, as a whole. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. I noticed that the uh, CSIS team, uh, kind of alone among the teams, made a, a very deliberate decision to uh, shift into the reserve components. And so I wonder if the CSIS team would kind of address uh, what they feel like that they saw in that uh, move that maybe the other teams missed. Clark? We made very deep cuts in the active Army, less so in the active Air Force, in terms of tactical aviation and in terms of BCTs. And our overall strategy was is that as a hedge, you need to have a mobilizable force, and we wanted to end up at the end of 10 years with more, with more reserve components in the ground forces is a hedge against the uncertainty involved with the deep cuts. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gretchen Peters. I'm from Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, this strikes me as a very uh, interesting exercise that you've that you've um, engaged in. However, in the beginning, you made an assumption um, that all of the efficiencies have been um, worked through the DoD, which is obviously a glaring mistake and an error. <laughs> and I'm wondering, isn't, the, um, I don't mean to be, come here and be the skunk at the party, but I, I wonder, have you, have, have, have there been other studies that have looked uh, for uh, the inefficiencies in the system, that have looked for ways that costs could be restructured, have looked for ways that instead of making ourselves weaker as a nation, we could actually be more efficient and reduce costs. Uh, and if you haven't, um, don't you think that would be a good uh, exercise for the future? Thank you. Uh, Todd, do you want to? Uh, you know, it, it was not a mistake that we assumed the efficiencies. We were just being generous. Um, it was deliberate that we did that. Um, but I will say that, you know, the efficiencies that have been assumed, uh, and keep in mind that when DOD has uh, highlighted these efficiencies, um, they've banked those savings and already spent the money. Uh, and so when those savings do not come true, there's a bill to pay because we've already spent the savings. Uh, and the odds of all of those savings coming true are low, quite frankly. If you look historically, um, you know, it seems like almost every SecDef comes in and thinks that they can, you know, save about 5% in the defense budget from efficiencies. And lo and behold, it rarely uh, materializes to that level. Um, so I, I think that's a real risk going forward. Um, we did, we wanted, that was already in the baseline, the FY13 baseline, uh, and so that's what all of the ads and cuts were relative to, and we deliberately did not give the team the option um, to, you know, bank any more savings on these phantom efficiencies. Jim? Yes. Um, the defense budget faces a double whammy effect right now that I've been beating the drum about for almost a year. It's both internal cost growth because of an inability to control costs, and it's the declining defense dollar, which is the top line coming down. A 
decrease in the top line is going to feel like a 40 percent decrease. If current trends continue, by the time you get out to 2023, you have no money left for procurement. It's all being spent on O&M, being spent on increasing personnel costs. So our approach, my approach in particular on this one is to say, look, uh, every time, and I've been a re defense reform maven ever since Beyond Goldwater, uh, since Goldwater Nichols, um, I'm giving up on it because the system hasn't had the internal fortitude to do it. What we are doing is making very explicit that when you apply these kind of top-level cuts to a department that has not been able to fundamentally change the way it does business for the last 20 years, uh, you are going to end up with a ca capacity challenge that is daunting. You're going to have much less of the kinds of capabilities you need, and perhaps then, you know, the political system, the masters uh, in all elements of the political system will recognize that if we do not address these kind of fundamental reform issues, you know, the nation's security will be badly weakened. That's why I encourage you to take a look at the letter that people have talked about on Next Mending. This is the bad news side of the story. The good news side of the story is if you don't do the things that are advocated next Monday's letter, this is where you're going to end up. Bob? very much along the same lines. We talked about this after the uh, exercise on Friday, uh, and we basically said, you know, we ought to rerun this uh, exercise where we just assume sequestration because uh, we might as well just say, look, uh, it doesn't appear as though Congress is going to uh, go anywhere else except for sequestration. So run this instead of at different levels, run it with different types of BRACs. And the reason why I use BRAC in the broadest sense of the term, where Congress doesn't appear to want to individually vote on anything, so you have to give them a package. So a basis BRAC, we have to do that. If we don't, we are really going to be in trouble. We have to do an infrastructure organizational BRAC. We have to delayer headquarters. We have to consolidate depots. We have to do a compensation BRAC. Compensation is totally out of control right now, and we have to get a handle on it. And we have to do a deregulation BRAC. Uh, I was talking with some people in the defense industry in the last three months, 182 regulations have come aboard, and if we want to have better buying power, regulations isn't the best way to go about doing it. So I think in time, and it goes right along with the letter that will come out on Monday where we have to address this overhead, if we can tackle this problem in a sensible way, the problem becomes much less dire. And so I can't, uh, I can't echo what uh, Clark said enough. This is the biggest problem we face, and we need to face it forthrightly. Tom? Um, uh, the only thing I would mention, in addition to what Todd said, is uh, some months back, uh, I did happen to be in a small meeting with Secretary Panetta. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's uh, very earthy in his language. And the, the issue of roughly $200 billion worth of efficiency savings came up. And he just sort of uh, you know, looked up and said, well, we all know that's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> so uh, that, those are his words, not mine. Uh, so, uh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Mitzi. This has been a fascinating afternoon for me. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. I have two questions. Um, where, does, where do contractors fit into your personnel numbers? I, I don't know, are those all military numbers and kind of the way we've played with this? You go out as a military and you come in as a civilian as a contractor and somehow don't get counted anywhere? Is that, is that the way you were dealing with this? But I have a second question. Todd, why don't you, yeah, since you so did the model? We gave options in there um, to cut in strength by service, by active reserve component, uh, by DOD civilians, and to cut service support contractors. Okay. Uh, we did not have options in there for cutting contractors uh, in the kind of the, the metal bender side, the actual producers, because that, that happens through your acquisition programs. Um, and so, but when we roll up the personnel numbers uh, in there, um, the dollar amount includes savings from cutting contractor personnel as well. Um, I have a request that you do this on television so the rest of the public, I'm, I'm really quite serious about this, they need to be educated at the complexities that we're dealing with rather than just saying we'll do this to do that. They don't have a clue. Anyway, as a, civ as a citizen, I'd like you to do this for the country and not just for the small group. 
Thank you. We will have a video of this event up on our website after it, um, but your point's well taken. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I didn't hear the last word. Uh, any any one of you want to comment on the civilian personnel cuts that you made? Uh, did you target them in any particular way? You mean sort of in what offices and things like that, or what capabilities? It's just like, a, I mean, I don't know much about it. It's like, you know, it's a number uh, for the game purposes. I'm going to assume you just lumped personnel together, or but I'm wondering if anyone discussed if it would be a peanut butter spread or if it would be specific divisions or directorates. I think Todd should address what the rules of the game were. Yeah, we gave them the option to cut numbers by the thousand uh, DOD civilian personnel. I think you know some of the teams just took a, a proportionate cut relative to what they were cutting in end strength. I think other teams went a little deeper. Um, I don't know if you guys want to comment on exactly what you know your rationale was and the number you came up with. We, as I said, we took two runs at the civilian personnel issue. The first run was what we looked at as the growth of civilian personnel since the post 9-11 buildup. So it's gone from about 600,000 to 800,000. So our first bogey on that was reduce it by 20, 200,000. You know, D-Layer headquarters, so it is an enormous growth in personnel and many headquarters, both in the combatant commands and in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Then when we got to the point where we still had about $120, $150 billion that we had to cut out of the budget, that's when we went back. We looked at space, threw out some of the really expensive things we didn't think we could afford, and then went back again to personnel took another 5% off of civilian personnel for a 25% cut, and then, because we still had made our bogey, is when we took some reserve component cuts and a few more active component cuts. But personnel is the only place in move one where you can get the numbers. Huh? Yeah, I just want to say, we took a pretty conservative approach, I think probably the most conservative approach to that category of savings. Uh, and, and that was really an admission that we don't know very much about it. I would be delighted to cut, you know, the contractors that work for the QDR offices of the services, <laughs> for example, but that wouldn't save a lot of money. On the other hand, uh, you know, the, the civilian contractors who are tending the grounds and flipping the burgers at Fort Hood, uh, you know, I don't want those jobs to be done by people in uniform. So before, you know, the temptation to, to win money by schwacking that account was, was pretty great. But we tried to restrain ourselves in essentially uh, because we didn't know exactly what the effect would be. The way the model worked is it, uh, you had increments on the BRAC of $5 billion and you could do up to six increments. So you could spend $30 billion in the first FIDIP you would only get three-fifths of the money back in the second FIDIP. But we were playing a four-FIDIP game, so we maxed out the BRAC in the first FIDIP to the tune of $30 billion because we have so much excess infrastructure. And we would accrue a lot of savings over time. So the majority of the civilians would have come out of the reduction of the total infrastructure of the Department of Defense. They were not targeted, but they were assumed to be primarily associated with the large uh, you know, de-layering and uh, cutting of infrastructure that our team did. Yeah, my, my understanding, and I don't have the data right in front of me, but uh, that if you go from 9-11 to where we are today, uh, the percentage increase in the active armed forces is uh, relatively small compared to the percentage increase in the civilian workforce. And so I think part of the rationale in putting the model together was, hey, we're drawing down from the war. Uh, but there's also some anecdotal evidence. I remember Michelle Flournoy, who had served in OSD policy in the Clinton administration, coming back as the undersecretary for policy and saying, where all these civilians come from in policy? We've practically doubled the number of civilians that work at OSD policy. So 
uh, again, uh, it, it wasn't a, an attempt to just sort of uh, make magic cuts, uh, but th there is, I think, some significant data and also anecdotal evidence that, uh, you know, as we draw down from these two conflicts, uh, this is an area we can probably draw down at minimal risk as well. Uh, yes, sir. Cameron Luthi, Bloomberg Government. A couple of the teams referenced overseas basing, AEI and I think uh, CSBA as well. Um, in that discussion, um, I'm curious about the, the uh, on the one hand, CSBA talked about increasing resiliency of bases in the Pacific theater, and AEI talked about trying to maybe avoid reducing our footprint in the Middle East, um, if, if you could elaborate on those. Yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, Tom. I should say uh, another shout out to Todd because he built a couple of options for us that weren't in the original uh, model, and we might have, you, you know, what an expanded structure in the Middle East would look like based on where we are now is, you know, would be a somewhat fanciful exercise. So it was more an aspiration that we couldn't put a number on, uh, but. I'd, I'd say overall we were extremely concerned for a global power and a power protection military that the ability to deploy and operate in theater is a long way for the continental United States uh, would be something that we would have to do, that we had to invest in both to get spaces and places. Uh, and so when there were options available to at least express our interest in an expanded global posture, we put money there. Jim, do you want to outline your approach? Sure. I mean, I, I think our overall sense was that today, especially in the Western Pacific, we just have uh, uh, too many of our eggs in too few baskets uh, between Okinawa and Guam in particular. Um, so we were very interested in, diversific in diversifying our posture uh, throughout the region, as well as in, in terms of increasing the resiliency of, of, each, of the, each of the air bases and, and some of the ports in the region as well. Um, a lot of times you hear the phrase, and I've, I've used it myself, um, we, need, we need places, not bases. Um, but as we've looked at it, that really is not adequate. Uh, you, there's, there's an upfront infrastructure bill that has to be paid. You just can't simply uh, C-17 your way into a crisis, land, set up your THAAD, set up your PAC-3s, uh, set up fuel bladders and all the rest. A lot of these things are going to have to be done up front or it becomes destabilizing in a potential crisis. Uh, that means we need more ramp space, we're going to need more fuel capacity, uh, we're going to need munitions storage, and these are going to have to be protected uh, against the sorts of A2, AD threats we might face. One of the options in the model was to consolidate European bases, and so we chose that model and we retained Europe primarily as a strategic trampoline as, and retained the primary bases that would allow east-west movement. Uh, and then the other options that you had in the model really were these bare basing, you know, a diversification of basing throughout the Pacific. And I wouldn't be surprised if most of all of the teams went after that. We also went after more tenders, uh, which would give the Navy a better opportunity to disperse its submarine fleet in time of a crisis. Yes, sir. Bill Courtney with CSC. Uh, to what extent uh, did IT substitute for platforms. Uh, IT's embedded in a lot of the things that you considered. How did IT fare? I think IT fared pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen. Yeah, I, I don't think there was a separate, you know, IT investment category, but it was embedded in, um, you know, it essentially was, when we said this in a programmatic way, so it was embedded in that, but it was also, you know, uh, I suppose you would say that cyber investments would represent an IT investment. So there were ways to capture it, but there wasn't a discrete line item, so to speak. The uh, Clark? In our uh, team, and I think probably in JT's team as well, uh, CSBA, we maxed on things like s and space, uh, cyber, and comms in the first round, and then went back and revisited that and subtracted a few things 
because of the expense and space and the cost that we would have had to pay in additional personnel cuts. But I think on the whole, uh, three of the teams ev heavily stressed these kinds of investments in the space and cyber world. Our total bill for space was 80 billion more over the two moves. For cyber, it was 30 billion more. For comms, it was 30 billion more. And that's the maximum we could do except for space. Yes, sir. So the, the game allowed you to drift from DSG. Sorry, my name is Paul Tennant. I work uh, for the British Army, but as an exchange officer in HQDA. Uh, the game allowed you to drift from DSG 12, and it struck me that several of the teams took that opportunity with both hands. I'd be really interested to, to know what areas you chose to drift away from DSG 12 in and why. Tom? Well, I don't care for the DSG strategy, frankly. I think that's a strategy that incorporates American withdrawal from the world. So I wanted to, you know, go back to something prior to that. Uh, so we definitely, I mean, we said this in the presentation, we said that up front. Also, we were not anxious to take a strategic pause. It seems, I mean, you know, you can argue it one way or the other, but it seems my colleagues were all willing to sacrifice near-term risk or take greater near-term risk. And uh, Clark at least talked about a place in terms of the Middle East, I, I just don't think that it would be strategically wise to continue to withdraw from a region that's so volatile and, and remains so important. So we, we started from, you know, we diverted from that from the get-go and tried to follow the logic of staying engaged and still trying to uh, patrol uh, the perimeter, so to speak. Uh, and that was the logic that we followed through the whole game. Upward. We think that the DSG strategy was r relatively sound. Uh, you know, a focus, a rebalance towards Asia and uh, remaining engaged in the Middle East but with fewer boots on the ground. Um, and then uh, doing low cost, low put footprint appro approaches in all the other uh, theaters, Europe, uh, Africa, and uh, Southcom. So we think that that is basically sound and you can do it. Uh, I, I think Clark's description where this forces you more towards a coercive element of national uh, power instead of a shaping element, I think that is true uh, in, at this level of cuts, and it's reflected in Tom's unease uh, because I think he is a big uh, fan of shaping. So I think perhaps if you read the uh, DSG, it says that we'll do a lot of shaping, but you simply can't do that type of, uh, the, I mean, the level of activity that we've been used to doing over the last 25 years. So I think, uh, but overall, I think the DSG, uh, the, you know, the two primary theaters and uh, low footprint, low cost approaches, I think that was pretty much what we all kind of followed. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, can oh, I just, sorry, I think yeah, Jim. Clark and I wanted just to add, um, what we really tried to do on the CSB team was sharpen the focus in terms of the mission areas uh, from, from the defense strategic guidance. Uh, and, and we really prioritized that of the 12 mission areas, we really focused hard on how we were gonna project power into anti-access and area denial environments. Uh, and, we, and we kind of conflated that with countering WMD and saw you know, WMD to a large extent, it's also another form of an anti-access challenge. Um, and, then, and then the two others, which we put a lot of emphasis on uh, and gave highest priority, one is strategic deterrence and the other was uh, continued e efforts in terms of counterterrorism. Yes. Um, we were explicit where we departed from the DSG. Um, we believe that there's been a debate for some time whether the DSG strategy was consistent with the first round of $500 billion cuts. I think AEI's team concluded it securely is not and saw a big gap between uh, what the strategy stated it could do and the resources that it had with it. Um, the administration says, no, they're consistent. Uh, I fall, personally, I fall somewhere in between, thinking that the DSG is currently underfunded. I don't think there's any question in my mind, however, that the DSG in 2012, as expressed, cannot be funded adequately, near adequately, with another $500 billion in cuts over 10 years. And that's why I said, you have to do something. 
in order to change your strategy. One thing was the strategic retreat uh, from the Middle East, which Tom would point out is already underway, and it is underway. Our approach would accelerate that. The second thing is a revival of the whole burden sharing thing. During the whole Cold War, and this is my underlying uh, beef, let's put it with BPC, Building Partnership Capacity, during the Cold War, we cared more about our allies' security than they did. Allies were free riders. We see the same thing today. We see the same thing today, particularly in Europe, where their budgets are going down faster than ours. And the proportion of the spending that's, uh, that the United States is responsible for in NATO is going up, not down, during this time. Uh, my belief in Asia is we're going to have to have a much more differentiated policy. Our major allies are capable of defending themselves. And the Japanese will have to do more. The South Koreans will have to do more. The Australians, you know, I want a basic carrier in Australia. I'll let them spend less in their defense, which the country is doing right now, if they're willing to serve as a, as a, a, a much larger base for American presence, which is much cheaper to maintain there than it is to keep sending it back and forth across the Pacific. So the approach, you know, I just don't believe in build, building partnership capacity. As I said, our approach was anything that had BPC on it, we cut. The very patient gentleman over here with the microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, John King. I'm a retired Navy and OSD budget analyst. And uh, over my almost 30-year career, I had the task of matching requirements on one end to budget and resources on the other, and then making sure that they were executing through their uh, program period. Uh, and then after I retired, I decided uh, uh, we needed to take a different view, so I, I volunteered and was on the uh, defense team for the President's Deficit Commission and helped form a lot of those uh, uh, illustrative savings that some of you are kind of repeating here. But if I use my due diligence type of uh, analytic techniques and look at the presentations you made, I think you're sub-optimizing, and I'd only give you a C. And the reason for that is, from the money side, the budget side, uh, I'm an economist by, uh, by education, and I see that we're in such deep trouble on the debt, uh, sequestration is a, is a given and that it's going to get worse because basically our economy is topped out, which means the money available to share among all the programs is going to decrease. So if we're trying to think through what does defense look like on the American side, we're going to need to have some major changes about doctrine, global commons, uh, our whole mix of technology and stuff. Uh, plus we have some lessons we don't seem to have learned and I didn't see expressed here. We've just fought 12 years of war with the most powerful military the world's ever seen with high technology, and we still don't know what a victory looks like. I mean, Martin Van Krewald once said, insurgencies are the norm, not force on force. Yet I don't see anything in each of your four presentations that talk about how do you fight insurgencies effectively, if we can. So I guess, uh, plus I like Mr. Murdoch's approach about our allies not paying the bill. By the way, I call them the coalition of the billing. So, uh, but what I'd like to see is less marginalism, I guess, in what your presentations were, and more creative destruction as to what do we do, how do we do it effectively, so that we can get a better outcome. It, uh, Tom, yeah, Tom's chomping at the bit I, here. There, there, well, there, so there, there's a lot to discuss there. But I'm not in the destruction business. I like the world that the United States has created. It's not perfect, but it, you know, as a student of history, it's sure a heck of a lot better than many of the alternatives that have come before it. Uh, and I thought, actually, we had learned to fight insurgencies pretty well and had essentially stamped one out in Iraq uh, not too long ago, uh, and it seems to have, have, have come back uh, because we didn't continue to suppress it. And I also don't know any other way to get the outcome that we would like to have out of that region. So, I, you know, again, I'm trying to, we're trying to keep things together, keep the international system together, not tear it apart. So, yeah, we need to, I'm not interested in radical change in the police force that polices the world. I think the, the world would be a different place, and that's the measure of defense effectiveness. 
not the size of the budget or the amount of the overhead. Yes, sir. Sure. By, uh, excuse me. Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. I don't think this is part of the game, but I wonder if you can just address what happens to some of this equipment that's actually divested. I think, Jim, you mentioned 1,100 tactical airplanes. Do they sit in the desert? Are they sold to allies who may not be able to afford new airplanes? Um, just if you can address that subject and how that may address some of the risks that the scenarios play through. Sure. Um, we've looked at it in the past in terms of uh, excess defense articles, and uh, Clark won't like this, but building partner capacity. I mean, is it possible to transfer some of these capabilities uh, to, to some of our allies uh, when and where they're needed? Um, one of the things that's been a drawback for that in the past has just been operating costs for systems like the B-1, uh, which if we were going to retire uh, a large block or the entire force of B-1s, I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, to the, to the extent the A-10s have, I mean, it's it, fantastic aircraft for close air support um, would be very valuable for a lot of allies uh, uh, and partners around the world, especially in the developing world. Okay, uh, last question from this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, John Arviv with Citigroup. I was just wondering if you could address exactly uh, what it might take for DOD to put out some kind of budget proposal that reflects something similar to what you guys have put together in terms of a flat or a slope down, um, when that might happen, and then also what we might expect out of the ongoing strategic channel, uh, question management review that's going on that Secretary Hagel is currently looking at. We should hear something over the next few days, theoretically. Thank you. Okay, if I understand your question, it's, it's actually two questions. Uh, one is, one, do the, any of these think tanks plan on putting out sort of a detailed uh, pro, uh, No, so what do you think it'll take for the DOD to put out uh, officially? in a February to April time frame, a budget that reflects the Okay, field. thank you. Gentlemen? Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what it would take. I think it's a low probability. Um, but, you know, I think what would be good for the debate is if DOD were to put out a budget amendment for 2014 uh, that cuts $52 billion from their FY14 request to bring it in line with the budget caps under the BCA. Not because uh, any of us are advocating for that level of budget cut, but rather so that people could see what would happen uh, and make an honest effort uh, doing the best you can to live within, you know, DOD's share of that budget cap will be about $475 billion for FY14, $52 billion less than what they requested. Um, but, you know, actually show people, show Congress in particular, specifically what would happen uh, if they tried to cut to that level in as rational of a manner as they could. Uh, I think that would really help further the debate. I don't think it's very likely to happen, though. <laughs> Having just... Oh, go ahead, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think, I think we're all sort of, you know, in the land of unreality here. I was going to say that for DOD to head in my direction, you'd at least need a change of administration, but I'm not even sure that would, uh, uh, you know, make, make that happen. I think the only thing that's likely to be a forcing function is something really bad happening in the world. Uh, as the attacks of 9-11 undid the first attempt at defense transformation, I'm sure there's something bad out there that will uh, likewise uh, spoil the forfeit up plan that Bob has in mind, as elegant as it may be. Okay, well, for by, uh, could, uh, Bob, yes, sure. Having just come out of the Department of Defense over the last four years, there's a lot of change fatigue in the Department of Defense. Uh, you know, I came in my first year, there was the 2010 QDR. The following year, we did the 30 billion efficiencies drill. The next year, we did the strategic uh, review, which ended in the first $500 billion cut. And now the uh, department is struggling to compensate, I mean, to come to grips with the BCA, which quite frankly, we just kind of ignored up until the 1st of January, 2012, because we could not imagine, quite frankly, that it would happen. Um, so I think we're going through a period where the Department of Defense will go through uh, a period of, you know, introspection. And the first thing we, uh, I think, we're still in the denial phase. Everyone's saying, well, it might not be as bad as sequestration. I think we need to get past that phase and just say, how do we do sequestration and let's work with Congress to get a ramp that will not destroy the greatest armed forces in the world. And uh, I'm certain that if we do do a $52 billion BCA cut in 14, 
that it will take us a decade uh, to get the forces back. Like I said, I was in 1975 as a lieutenant and I was buying toilet paper for my Marines because we didn't have enough money uh, in the budget. And that's what those type of cuts, the, the $52 billion BCA cuts would do in 14 based on the hole we've dug already in 13. So the key thing though, uh, and this is where Tom and I disagree, is since the end of the Cold War, we've been at war more months than we've been at peace. We cannot sustain this model. We have to do a different model. Now, I don't know what that model is. Uh, our team said over time what you're going to have to do, just because of the inevitable rise in cost of uh, military manpower, uh, you're going to have to go to more autonic, uh, autonomous and robotic systems. But what does that mean for an insurgency? What does that mean in terms of global patrolling? What does that mean in terms of maintaining global order? We had a four hour, you know, we did this in four hours on a Friday, and then we had a couple beers after. The fact that you gave us a C, I'm saying, right on, man. So the key thing is what this model really does, and I think all of us would echo this, is this model says, if you do this craziness the way we're planning to do now, you are going to have some serious problems, and it's time to get serious. And so I think the department is just going through, you know, it's going to have to do a QDR, I think, and follow on to the scammer. And uh, I think we got a lot of work to do with Congress to try to get this right. Clark? No, I'll let Bob have the last word. It was okay. an eloquent statement. All right. I fully support it. Well, I'm, I'm going to offer a final uh, observation uh, from listening from, uh, to my four colleagues here. Uh, there's a story that's told that at, after the end of World War II, uh, the United States uh, sends its ambassador back to Italy, which of course had fought on the other side during the war, and you have to remember this is Italy. And uh, so they, but they're anxious because Mussolini's gone, the communists are there, nobody knows what's going to happen, and they want him to cable back as soon as he can on you know, a sort of a status report on, on how things are going in Italy. And uh, the ambassador leaves and he's over there for a week and there's no cable. And he's over there for another week and there's no cable. And uh, finally Atchison sends a cable over, you know, we need some kind of status report, even if it's brief. And the next day they get a cable back <clears throat> from the ambassador of Italy that reads, situation here in Italy is critical but not serious. And uh, you sort of get the feeling, you know, listening to these gentlemen, that you know, we have a very serious situation here, but we're not treating it seriously. Uh, there are opportunities uh, to uh, mitigate the problems that we have, even under sequestration. Uh, things like, uh, you know, um, BRACs and, you know, reforming military pay and uh, civilian personnel and so on. But we're not taking those opportunities. And you can see what happens, uh, you know, the third rail used to be hollow military. Well, you, you look at where the, where the red lines were, the red bars, and basically it's, it's, it's a near-term hollow military. And what kind of um, planners, if they see the long-term security environment worsening, start cutting back on their defenses? So, it, it, yeah, but this is the situation you have, and these are the consequences, uh, you know, as these gentlemen have laid out, one way or another, uh, that you're going to confront in some mix uh, if we don't begin to get serious. So, on behalf, well, first I'd like to thank my colleagues at CSBA for putting this together, particularly uh, Jim and Todd and, and Mark Gunzinger uh, and the uh, support staff, uh, but also my colleagues at our sister think tanks. Uh, it's a great to have an opportunity to work with them. Uh, so again, we really appreciate their time and their effort and their talent. Uh, and uh, finally, thank you all for coming today. And uh, they, they did want to talk to the guy who gave them the C outside afterwards. So, so if you could just hang, hang back, sir, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be over there directly to talk to you. Uh, but again, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.